Hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to talk about how to write in pneumatic Go code using domain driven design. And my name is Damiano Petrungaro, I'm an Egoless software engineer, and I develop, as you may imagine, uh, application using Go. And I'm specialized in coding complex uh, domain. Uh, I, came, I come from Italy, uh, may sound like it for my accent, uh, I'm trying to make it better, sorry about that. But, and exactly I come from Tivoli, uh, that is a small city next to Rome which has an amazing history about gardens and as well as modern arts, but it's also well known in the area because of the huge holes that there are on the ground. Uh, is, they say they're gonna fix it, but I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon. And also we are famous for our amazing driving skills, and as you may see here, uh, in the in the slide, there is a red dot pointing to a red car, and the person actually decided to park the car in the middle of the main street to go and buy some grocery and come back after solid five minutes, uh, blocking the whole city since it was the main street. And but jokes apart, uh, Tivoli is an amazing city. I would highly recommend you to visit it if you're planning to visit Italy or. Rome, since it's pretty close to Rome, and something I want to add on top of that is I want to let you understand how much I take myself seriously, seriously uh, and this is myself at work. Uh, if you disagree with anything that I say or I code, I'm totally fine with it, just feel free to reach me out, we can even have a discussion about it and you, you may change my mind or I may change your mind. Your mind. So. I'm going to tell you something before actually analyzing the main content of this talk, and I'm going to tell you what drove me to this talk. So, once upon a time, a PHP engineer, and I used to be a PHP engineer, yes. And, I mean, PHP is not famous for being the best language ever, uh, pre actually it's pretty far from it, um, but the community around PHP is terrific, and the language has a lot of DDD uh, advocates, so domain driven design, also known as DDD, as you will say, hear me saying a lot of time here. And I have been affected by the community about this methodology as well. So I have been studying and practicing for the last, I think, three years more or less. And just to give you a brief example, uh, summary of what is domain-driven design, is a set of patterns that will help you to structure a complex or not complex uh, applications. And this is something that, of course, uh, the domain-driven design approach, I mean, uh, uh, changed a bit my mindset, and I almost take, inside, take consi consider it during almost the development of almost any project. And, but anyway, time passed by, uh, after a few years of writing PHP, I started writing Go more and more and more until it ended up to be my main language, so I became a gopher. Not sure if this is a gopher or a squirrel, but hopefully it will make the point. And so when moving from PHP to Go uh, as an everyday language, I noticed that DDD doesn't resonate within the Golang community because, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, most people think that DDD influences an OOP way uh, of when writing Go code, since the main, uh, the major, uh, the majority, sorry, of the books and example about the domain driven design patterns are written in object oriented design. And I generally believe that Go community is missing the benefit of this methodology. So I decided to write uh, down this talk uh, and some of my ideas uh, to hopefully convince you to apply those methodologies as well to your projects. So let me start saying that PHP is object oriented. Golang is not object oriented, but DDD is both and not at the same time. And we're going to see later on because it is possible to fully apply domain driven design in Go applications without going to be in a trap in the object oriented way of writing code. And this is actually my goal. My goal. So allowing and actually explaining you that it's possible to write in the Go code without falling into a Java application written in Go. So domain driven design, uh, DDD is composed of two sides and those two sides uh, can work without the other one. And I choose this GIF actually because when they're combined, so represented by the, the dog in the middle, they can give you a lot of benefits. And actually it's where their full power comes in. So the two sides are strategic and tactical designs. And the strategic one is just the uh, set of, uh, is just the way uh, of how uh, the domain expert, so the people who knows a lot about the domain and you as an engineer, analyze the domain, define the, the bounded context, so the different area of your domain, and the best way to allow those contexts to communicate with each other. And as you may assume, this side is not at all about code. 
is really pretty code uh, uh, agnostic. And on the other side, there is the technical design that is pretty, pretty closer to the code side of the things. And the technical design describe a set of patterns that you can use to shape as code all the invariants, so all the rules that makes your domain unique. Uh, and model, of course, in a dom during the domain analysis. Uh, this, the, the approach of applying technical the design patterns is driven usually by strategic design, but as I said before, it may be not. We can still apply te raw technical patterns without strategic design on top of that. And the end goal of applying those patterns is to model the code in a simple but expressive and safe way. And we're going to see it later on. So the first thing that I want to discuss is about the relationship between packaging and the bounded, the concept of the bounded context from domain driven design. And in Go, a package is just a boundary providing a set of API used to create or modify a set of those structures that, in that given, con in that specific context, have a specialized meaning. Uh, so let's pick up an email address example, uh, and it's in main generic uh, definition. And email address is just an identifier of an email box. Uh, to which a message is sent, is delivered to. Um, but we may be conjugating and specializing the meaning of this uh, email address in different contexts. For example, in our product, we may have an admin and a, and a customer area. And in the admin area, we may allow only admin addresses, uh, email addresses that ends up with, I don't know, at whatever.com. Uh, but in the customer area, we allow any customer to have any possible email. And so, a way of actually poss uh, possibly representing this concept is to having an email package, as I showed here, that is exposing two different factory functions, new admin email, new customer email, and any of them is actually returning the specialized type. So the first one would be returning the admin email, and the second one would be returning the customer email, with some validation on top of that. This little solution may not lo look bad at first view, at least in my opinion, as we're still using the, the ubiquitous language from the domain, so all the set of words that have a specific and special meaning for us, and, but still we're not considering one of the most critical topics of, uh, about domain-driven design, uh, the context. Because when grouping things by kind, we are communicating that by design, there, are, there, there is only one package that is representing a context as the owner of the two different email address uh, implementations. And this poor design uh, uh, implementation, I think it gets even more clear when we try to get an email at the email address package for another party. So we go get it and we are going to download both of the implementation also if we need just one of them. So in my opinion, it's really essential to underline another possible way of designing this uh, this use case and is actually supported by some domain-driven design arguments, so grouping things by context. And this approach leads to having a design that is uh, design uh, packages that considering the boundaries and the and the, of the domain, avoiding to rethink how to group different packages again. And this is a possible implementation. We may have the customer package and the uh, admin package. Both of them are representing the admin context and the customer context. And both of the packages are giving a, spe a special meaning to the new email function. And the packages are protecting and isolating the different invariants of the two uh, different boundaries. And grouping things by context highlights that we are using the domain analysis that we did in the first phase. So there is no actually need of any extra effort to shape the solution again. Or another probably just everyday more technical example that I should see happening over and over is events dispatch, the dispatchment sub events. Uh, I notice that a lot of teams usually place the events, all of them in the same uh, directory, so in the same package, bounding different domain models together, even if those are not related uh, to each other. For example, the events package will own some customer information, some product information, some user information. Uh, a better way, in my opinion, is to take advantage of the context and split them, split those events based on the model that produced them, letting the domain analysis help you define which boundary holds what. And we can mod, uh, model this in two ways, so depending on the existing relationship of our teams, and uh, and in, I don't know, in, the, in, in this case, this code base is maintained by a team that has no other team depending on those events. So we can easily group them in the same package where the model sits without the need of recreating any kind of sub package. And oops, 
to quickly detect the relationship and the communication of packages living in the same code base, I think it's mandatory to understand the dependencies between each package. And the folder structure needs to explain the dependencies between the boundaries of the domain and set the policies to avoid the possible high coupling or cascading dependencies of a related code. And I think it's possible to not have high coupling uh, when there are no imports of packages that are living on the same level. So, or just in, and since it's just representing a non-optimal design choice uh, from the code side. Uh, and when importing packages that are on the same level, it's possible most of the time to decouple them and extract some of the information in a third one. Uh, as an example, uh, we see here it's mandatory, given those two different packages, to allow the communication between them. So there is a delivery team and a product team, and the delivery team needs some information about the domain, the product model, and the product model need, may need some information about the delivery model. So it means that one of the two packages may need to import the other one. Uh, and making us actually hard to understand what is the relationship between those two packages. So um, the two teams, anyway, may want to operate in a decoupled way. And since the two, the, the, the domain language, so the language just partially overlaps between the two products and not fully overlaps. So there may not even the need of creating a full upstream, downstream communication with the, between the two teams. Uh, a package structure that is holding uh, this domain actually may, lo may look like this. Uh, so when this happens, it's possible to use some of the patterns that are uh, specified from the inside the domain-driven design literature. And in the main goal is to avoid direct dependencies between do those two packages. And I think one of the most used strategic design patterns is actually the anti-corruption layer. Since this pattern can be used uh, when two or more contexts, one context, need to share some detail about the domain model but, and the teams anyway wants to protect themselves from the chance of the leaking data in ubiquitous language from the, other, uh, from the other one. And this may be simply achieved implementing a third package, in this example is a super silly name PubSub, uh, that can translate the, thin, the data between the two different packages uh, without actually the need of importing any of them uh, with each other, reducing the possible number of cascade dependencies as well. And bringing back the event example that we used before, uh, things start being different when there are teams that are depending on the events exposed by uh, the different kind of the, the different packages. So it means that we may have an upstream downstream relationship where the upstream team actually dictates the rule of the representation of the events. But anyway, they may, st may still want to take into consideration the downstream team needs. And so using some domain driven design nomenclature, we can define this and actually identify this as a customer supplier relationship. And since the two teams want to find a smart and maintainable way of letting the packages communicate with each other, we can create some sub-packages that define the, the communication boundaries. So from this design, it means that the event package can be reused by a third party, but without requiring the whole knowledge of the whole customer package. And yeah, and that's it. <laughs> it's not always possible to decouple any way that easily the code base because of a thing named legacy code. Um, so uh, what happens is that there is also one pattern described from the DDD literature known as the big ball of mud. And this one defines that interaction, how, how should the interaction with a code base that is hard to maintain or hard to rely on should happen. And this, the answer is just don't import or that code or just try to get away as much as possible from the legacy code base. So what we may do is just copy the thing that we need and then refactor it on our side without touching the, the legacy code. And this is also known as a little copy is better than a little dependency, uh, Go Proverbs, that is actually supporting this, uh, this idea. So hopefully I convinced you that Go packaging is essential for structuring big application. And each application has a different structure that should reflect the, the domain needs, the needs from the, from the company, and they couple the different components in an effective way. And I think that Golang packaging mechanisms uh, allow it to happen, um, and they match perfectly uh, with the pattern described from the domain-driven design literature. And actually applying those patterns will be enhancing the beauty of the language mechanisms. Aside from strategic design, as I said before, there is the, the, the tactical one. And those tactical design describe 
are, are described as a group of patterns that uh, we use to code to, to shape as code the invariants uh, of the domain model defined, the domain defined during the uh, strategic analysis. And the technical patterns are really, really well known in the communities of languages such as PHP, for example, Java or C Sharp, uh, because the resources available today about DDD patterns are mostly in object oriented uh, paradigm. Uh, using the, the paradigm from object oriented. But this doesn't mean that it's hard or wrong to adapt those concepts uh, in different languages that are using different paradigms. So today I'm going to talk about you about two of those patterns, the value object that I do like to call value type and the repository pattern. But before going there, I want to take just uh, a different uh, direction for a second. Uh, and I think that we need in order to actually write idiomatic Go code without falling inside the, tra the trap of object-oriented code written in code in uh, Golang. And so, some of a lot of the uh, mostly actually of the object-oriented language uh, have something around them that is about the always valid state, uh, where a type shouldn't be created when it is not compliant with the invariant of its context. Uh, so it means that we should not be able to create an email with an invalid email address. And there are many ways of really reaching this, uh, achieving this goal. We may have the invalidation on our HTTP middleware, uh, some functions that are applying validation on our CLN inputs, or coupling the validation within the type that we want to create. And there, each way, sorry, has its own uh, bonus and malus, of course, and it's actually on us to consider them based on the programming language and the context that we are living to. And I'm saying so because in Go, there is no way to prevent the, the always valid state that is discussed really, really heavily in the domain-driven design literature. And that's it, it's not achievable. Get surprised. So uh, let's try to find a way to get around it to go around with it. So let's describe an, an, a domain example. So uh, we may have a product that help us to organize browser, uh, the, the tabs of our browser and the bookmarks in order to facilitate the interaction uh, of, the, of the tabs that we open and use the most. And this product will allow our customer to create the collection of tabs that are shared uh, between different workspace and allowing them to be super easy to uh, catalog catalogize and will help us our customer to be crazy productive. So the domain is all about tabs and book bookmarks. And so after we define the whole domain analysis in, and the domain analysis in the example is just my silly uh, summary of the product. Uh, what we can do uh, is, of course, we, we know that we have to code the tab uh, element, the tab model. Uh, and we know that the title of the tab uh, must be a string that is between 1 and 50 characters, and it always must exist. It cannot be nullable. And we may be implementing in this way, having the tab struct exposed with a table struct exposed, and in uh, any possible package, so main for example, we are able to create our title, uh, our tab with, a, with their title. And the first iteration is, is quite good, uh, it's pretty neat actually, but in the main.go file, line 14 in this, uh, uh, in this code, uh, you can see that I created the tab with an empty title and this is not allowed, right? We should be protecting the invariants of our domain. So we need to find a way to fix it. And it's possible to protect the invariants adding some validation rules inside the types, within the types, not inside. And so for example, still again, tab and title, both of them exposed, uh, exported, sorry. And now there is a new factory function that is applying some validation. And here we are able to create, to use the factory function to create the tab. Seems better than before. There are some validation rules that protect the invariants within the new factory function. But again, uh, we were still able to invalidate the invariants of the title at line 34, because by the language mechanism provided by Go uh, about the ex uh, exported identifiers, we can change it. And we set in an invalid state. And we may prevent this one to happen just making the title field unexported. So the code is the same as before, the title now is just unexported, 
and finally we created the title the tab sorry with a valid title and it cannot change from outside the tab package but 934 again the t2 uh, identifier is an invalid state it doesn't have a title at all or just to be more precise it has the zero value of the type of the title so the string is just an empty string and it's possible to be even more defensing returning an error from, know, from everywhere that we're uh, making uh, checking the title that, that is not an empty an empty string uh, but you start noticing that there is no way to achieve the always valid state when designing go because of the go lang language mechanism and instead of digging, or digging our own grave uh, we can try to achieve the of trying to achieve this and achieve a group, uh, achievable goal, what we may do is actually address this problem from a different point of view. And it's always only about balance. And as an engineer, it's part of my daily work actually to evaluate the trade off, minimizing as much as possible all the possible tech depth, balancing between the safety of the domain type and the simplicity of a, that another alternative may bring. And one of the things that I really liked about Go and the packaging philosophy behind it, at least partially agreed by the community, is the design of the package API. Since a package should be designed having in mind the usage, the usage of, that the user are going to do of it, of that package. And this philosophy choice is, I think, is perfect uh, to use for uh, the type design, domain type design, uh, when implementing technical patterns in in, uh, in Go. And I apply personally this philosophy exposing API needed to interact with the package and its own type in a safe way, empowering the end user to decide the usage of the package, uh, meaning that it will be still be able to create invalid types anyway, but it's on them, it's on the user side, on the user side, it's on, also on my side as well. And anyway, there are some circumstances where it may make sense to add some extra defensive programming practice. Uh, so unexported fields and whatsoever, but before making things more complex, uh, I do highly uh, recommend you to measure the need of it. So measure, measure the number of bug, of outages, of uh, incidents that has been caused by this lack of protection. And if then is needed, you can add them because it's a is a need. You see, you see, it has a need, not just as a as a way of design of designing something. So, given this, uh, this intro, now we're going to see how this approach is going to affect the whole implementation, allowing me to write idiomatic Go uh, and domain-driven design uh, tactical patterns. The first one I'm going to describe is the value type. I do refer to this as value type, but it's known as value object. But I don't like to have the object word in, uh, in this pattern when talking about Go, since there is no object thing. Uh, object uh, in, uh, in Go. Uh, so I try and it may trick us to go thinking in an object-oriented way, so I try to keep it off. And the value type is a pattern described in the DDD literature and is used to group related things as an immutable unit and comparable by the properties that compose it. What does it mean? It means that, as always, back to the title example, uh, we may have our own type, value type, the title, and it has a new title where it has its own validation rule and it's comparable by the property that composes it, right? So a value type is beneficial for representing concepts from the domain as code with built-in validation of the domain variants. And the API exposed by the title uh, package uh, allow us to uh, give you, for example, the new title uh, to check the validity of the incoming attributes and the measure benefit of coupling the validation rules uh, with a, a value type is the easier maintainability of the code base. In fact, there would be no need of duplicating uh, this validation logic elsewhere since we can reuse it. Mm, an example that I usually uh, do is this one. So I will have some data coming from an HTTP API call. I need to uh, unmarshal this JSON that is coming inside, I don't know, uh, things that I, that some model uh, val value type that I do need for the use case. So what I do is just, I create my own struct and then I will be using at line 13 here after I unmarshaled it, I will be using the validation, the, the validation logic defined once 
uh, without the need of creating it for only the HTTP uh, the HTTP layer. Uh, and a value type also exposed, as I said, by its definition, an equal method, so it needs to be compared to ensure that the comparison with other values are made using all the fields that the value type contains and not its memory address and reduce, reducing so the number of possible bugs and code duplication uh, because of the comparison that we want to do. In this example, the title is just a string, so it's just one thing, but it may be also composed by more than one field. And yeah, and also value types are designed as immutable and that's why the title has only value receiver on the methods, as you can see, oops, here and here and because it should be defined as immutable. Uh, think about time, time is defined as immutable, time is the perfect value object example, since also if we change its value, the previous one is still representing something in our domain, and it's still valid. And on top of this design concept, uh, having an immutable uh, value type, it's safer, because when using a value type as a field of a model, the immutable design keeps it safe from side effects due to a mutable shared state that we may have anywhere, and which is a common source of bug, especially in a concurrent programming language uh, such as Go. And of course, as I hopefully uh, let you understood, I do think that packaging, packaging is essential and important, when uh, designing an application. So I am going also to share with you where I do place my uh, value types. And I place the value types files in the package that owns the invariance implement, uh, implemented by the type, uh, by the value, uh, the value types, uh, since those values should not be shared across different contexts. And we are in a tab, so the, the title is owned by the tab, and so there is a tab package, I'm going to put it there. Sometimes it may make sense to reuse this uh, logic, for example, the title elsewhere. And as we did before, for example, with the events, uh, we may have a need then from a, a company point of view to expose it. So we, we may then create a title package, for example, that can be used and reused across different possible uh, uh, parties. But this should be a need. So don't do it by design, otherwise there will be two package pollution. Uh, other the value type, the, what I'm going to discuss is the value path, the repository pattern. Uh, it's probably, I think, the most known from the DDD world. And these patterns represent a mechanism which is used to map some domain types with uh, the persistent layer, exposing API that are mimicking an interaction with an in memory slice. And I usually represent it as an, with an interface that looks like this. And it has, of course, may not have always all the methods inside, but in this example, uh, is I mean, it's pretty simple. So what I'm going to do here uh, is just, for example, not having an update method since by our uh, domain of product, we don't allow up to update some tabs. And also, if there would be the need of splitting read and write, still possible, still achievable, splitting the two different interfaces. So the repository patterns uh, offer uh, multiple advantages from a design point of view as well as technical. And adopting these patterns allows uh, decoupling an application from a specific database implementation, such as MySQL, Mongo, Bigtable, whatsoever. And those better benefits are even more clear during testing, testing since they would be, uh, it, it will be possible to write in-memory implementation uh, only for the test without the need of putting the real implementation talking to a real database uh, in our tests. And also uh, there's another huge advantage during the migrations of, uh, of database. So when migrating an application to a different database is an expensive operation all the times, but it's possible to reduce the cost of it uh, using these patterns, because only one repository implementation needs to be created or updated, depending on the context, uh, to use the new database and the new repository uh, implementation. And the interface will be still protecting us, sorry, from the whole code, uh, uh, from updating the whole possible code base. And in order to facilitate also this uh, this task, it's important to use the errors that are inside the same interface package, that's why I put them here, 
in the implementations. So it means that he will be able to compare using the, the errors is and as um, functions from the errors package and enhancing, just enhancing inside, for example, our MySQL implementation, an error that is shared within the contract of the repository interface. And from the same point of view, uh, applying the repository patterns helps to define clear boundaries of your contest, keeping it decoupled from unrelated subdomains. Since the APIs are used mainly uh, value types, in this example, the ID, and, and aggregates or models, depending on how we want to name it, such as tab in this example. And the repository patterns APIs also enforce the usage of and the establishment of the ubiquitous language. And for example, uh, it is possible to use filter parameters in the read operation. For example, we want to re read all the possible active tabs, and we may do it in two different ways. We may do it in this way, so passing some filters, or exposing an API that is enhancing our usage, our need from the domain point of view. So saying, okay, from the repository, list all the active tabs. Uh, of course, if you need some extra uh, capability, searching capabilities, uh, you can still do this, but nothing is, uh, is blocking you to, to create a new uh, explicit API. As well as before, crucial where to place it and where I do personal place it, I put the, the, implement, the interface file uh, in the package that owns the aggregate or the domain model. Uh, but the files regarding the implementation, so the one who is going to use I don't know, and query over MySQL, um, I usually put them inside internal directory scenes. Those are highly coupled and the application uh, to the application and should never be reused in different places. Uh, apart from that, uh, there are way more uh, technical pattern, entity, aggregate, aggregate, root, domain service, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to discuss them due to, uh, due to time restriction, but I would like to say that any of them can be implemented in the same idiomatic fashion way that I did for the previous one. So uh, don't just be curious, go out there and try to implement them. So as conclusion, uh, I'm a bit uh, out of time, so let's go quick. Uh, hopefully I was able to uh, convince you that domain driven design help us to structuring and model our application all the time. So there will be no need of rethinking of how to structure application, where to put packages, how to, uh, when to separate and create a new packages and so on. And of course, uh, it will be possible to write idiomatic Go code. So no DTO, no DAO, uh, no any kind of possible, possible weird object, uh, but just pure Go code and using domain driven design. And actually I would like to, uh, hopefully I was able to underline that using domain driven design enhance and makes more efficient the language mechanisms. So uh, giving us, uh, letting the domain driven design within the uh, Go language mechanism help us to design our application. So that's it, that's, today for uh, that's all for today folks. Any question, anything, uh, let me know and you can reach me out on Twitter or email, up to you and yeah, see you soon. Thanks for listening.